time in the Cape, so I'm sure a lot of you know the flora uh, much better than I do. Uh, and you'll see as I'm getting into the show that there'll be a lot of familiar plants. I'm sure a lot of you have connections off the Cape too. Uh, so when you're off the Cape, you may not see every plant that I'm talking about on the Cape, but you'll probably recognize it from um, somewhere else. So, um, so that'll be good. And um, uh, let me just cover the first issue that might be on your mind right away, and that is how dangerous is it to eat wild things, all right? And the answer is different whether it's a plant or a mushroom. We do have some poisonous plants that go around here, but I'm happy to tell you the vast majority, this floor space up here, if anybody just wants to sprawl on the floor rather than standing up, uh, you can still see, there's another chair over here too. So anyway, um, all right, so, there are a few exceptions to this, but the vast majority of poisonous plants that grow around here taste horrible. So my advice is don't eat plants that taste bad. It doesn't mean that every edible wild plant is going to be delicious straight from the bush or the vine or whatever. A lot of them require some kind of advanced preparation. But if you see a plant and you think it's edible, you remember it from this talk, you read about it in a book, whatever, and you pick it and you bring it home, you prepare it according to instructions. You get a big steaming plate of it in front of you, and you take a bite, and it doesn't taste good. You might not want to override that danger signal in your taste buds might be giving you. You might have made a mistake in identification, all right? Okay, but for mushrooms, unfortunately, it's a different story because there are a bunch of mushrooms that have toxins in them, and a lot of those mushrooms that make you sick right away, and you have several hours of gastrointestinal distress, and then you get better, and, and you'd be fine. But there are at least six different kinds, including some that grow on the Cape, that are potentially lethal. And unfortunately, there's absolutely no indication from the flavor that there's anything to worry about. So you could have this delicious mushroom meal one day and be dead several days later from liver and or kidney failure. All right. <laughs> Having said that, you could range all the mushroom species that are on a line and cluster to one end of those species that are virtually impossible confused with anything poisonous versus those at the other end that even the experts can't tell apart. And as long as you stay at the safe end of the line and you gradually work your way out as you gain experience and confidence, that's how you stay out of trouble. Everybody get that? All right, great. So you may or may not know that there's one big advantage that Cape Cod has over the other places in the Northeast in terms of mushroom hunting, and that is your season goes longer. So when the season in the inland areas starts to wrap up shortly after Columbus Day, yours goes through the end of October. So you get a couple extra weeks. So sometimes you'll find people from the rest of New England showing up on Cape Cod in the latter part of October because their mushrooms are given out and they want to just you know, have that one last uh, opportunity to uh, look for mushrooms. So anyway, we'll get to mushrooms mostly later in the show because the main time to look for mushrooms in New England is from uh, around uh, the 4th of July until Columbus Day or here in Cape Cod the end of October. All right, so the, the photos are organized chronologically by foraging opportunity. All right, so before I get into the show, let me talk about one other issue, and that is conservation, because um, connecting to the outdoors and picking things, uh, you want to do it in an environmentally respectful way. I try to do that, I encourage you all to do that, especially when native species are involved, because native plants often have important roles in the ecosystem. Animals rely upon them for food or some other important portion of their life cycle. So I encourage people to use some forbearance and restraint when gathering native species just to make sure that you don't in any way impair that plant's ability. Continue to thrive in the location where you're finding it. Having said that, if, let's say, depends on the part of the plant you're harvesting as to what impact it's going to have. For example, berry picking and nut gathering and mushroom hunting, those are relatively benign foraging activities because all you're doing is picking the seed or the spore dispersal portion of the organism. There's often a lot of those around. You gather some, it's not that big a deal. But if you are digging up plants to harvest them or stripping all the flowers or all the leaves off plants to harvest them, you can imagine it could be a lot more traumatic for the plant. All right? So um, another issue is rarity, like... Um, 
uh, you know, the, the rare plant is, we're talking native species now, the, the more you have to uh, be really circumspect in picking it. So one thing you'd never want to do is to pick something on this date rare and endangered species list. Um, I have looked at that list. I'm happy to tell you there's relatively few species on that list that are edible, and they tend to be uncommon cousins of common edible wild plants, and they are restricted to pristine or unusual habitat. So what would that be? In general, that would be like a bog or a fen or a cliff or a mountaintop, or here in Cape Cod or coastal Massachusetts is basically the entire coastline, meaning the area that's within the influence of the salt water. That's considered unusual rare habitat in Massachusetts. So if you are in a place like that, my advice is be very careful when you're foraging to make sure that you're not picking any rare cousins of any common edible wild plants that might be in that habitat. For example, wild mustard that has yellow flowers, really, really common above the high tide line, fine to gather it as much as you want, but there are some rare relatives of that plant that you want to be careful about. I'll get a little bit into that in the show when I get to the coastal plants, all right? So, um, but having said that, there's the other end of the spectrum, all right? And that's, uh, so another list the state maintains that's much more likely a plant you wanna pick and eat is on the other list, and that's the invasive species list. All right, so here's a book that my agency helped put out about a dozen years ago that educates people about the 66 species that are considered the most ecologically harmful. These are the species that, the, the bad thing that they do is they usurp the habitat from native species, they take it away from them. So. Um, uh, so ecologically, the plants on the, in this book are bad news, but if there is a silver lining to the cloud, perhaps it's the fact that some of these plants are edible. In fact, out of the 66 species in this book, at least 20 of them are edible. And as far as most ecologists are concerned, they'd be thrilled if we all picked and ate as many of those as we possibly could. I am totally serious about that. It is guilt-free foraging. You can't pick too many of them, providing that you're not spreading the plants around in the process, but that is easily avoidable. And... Um, and I will feed you an invasive species as part of the program today. So uh, I'll get to that later. All right, so, um, but let me start the show with an invasive species that, um, I don't know if it grows in Truro, but I know it grows in Brewster, that's not far away, and that's this guy right here. This plant is at or near the top of the ecological blacklist. This is the plant that it's blooming or just finished blooming right now. It's about eight or nine feet tall. It's got those creamy white flowers on top. And uh, then in the winter, it just looks like these reddish brown bamboo-like stalks and it's forming this monoculture. And, um, and that's a plant called Japanese knotweed. And, um, and ecologically, the ecologists really despise it, but it is very yummy. I harvest a ton of it every year. And uh, so I'll get into the de de details of that. All right, so timing-wise, we're about the third week of April. And so imagine in your mind a place where you've seen this plant grow and uh, it's spring and you're seeing all the dried stalks from last year's plant. In the midst of all those dried stalks, you see a bunch of shoots that look like this. And it'll be about a foot tall. We'll have those little red uh, dots on the stem. And the whole thing is very soft and supple. You just snap it off at ground level and then uh, bring it home and steam it for a few minutes and knead it hot or cold like asparagus. Uh, which is good, but there's a stage of this plant I like even more, and that's what I call the wild rhubarb stage. So when the stalks get a little taller, so in the Boston area, that's the first week of May, I'm not exactly sure of the timing here, uh, I'll harvest it and use it just like rhubarb. So, um, so I'll cut off the stem at the bottom, and then I'll end up with a stalk that looks like that, and I'll cut off the top, and then I'll peel the very outer layer, the skin, off the knotweed stalks because it's stringy so it can get caught in your teeth. Nothing poisonous about it, but I just take it off there just to make whatever I use the knotweed in uh, more uh, yummy. But the knotweed stalks are hollow, so you don't want to peel too deeply or all you've left is the hole. You just want to get that very outer skin off and then you end up with a green, crispy green tube like that, which you can eat right in the spot. It's tart and juicy, kind of like a Granny Smith apple. Or you can chop it up like I've done here and then use it instead of rhubarb in virtually any recipe calling for rhubarb. So here is my strawberry knotweed pie that I make every year and virtually everybody I feed this to prefer it over strawberry rhubarb pie. It's really yummy, the recipe's in my book. And uh, all right, so about 10 years ago, I'm doing a program, we run into a patch of knotweed and talking about the knotweed pie and bragging about it. And some smart aleck in the group says, well, of course your pie tastes good, it has 
strawberries in it. And I said, all right, yeah, I, I'll admit that. So, but those of you that bake and use rhubarb know there's lots of things you can do with rhubarb you don't have to put strawberries in there. So now there's many other things that I bake with the uh, knotweed. So you don't have to you know, throw the strawberries in there to make it taste good. It tastes good just fine on its own. All right, so, but perhaps you're all really accomplished bakers, but I suspect there's a few in the audience that are looking at that pie and say, I don't know, I'm a little intimidated by pie crust, that lattice work top. I don't know if I can pull that off. So I'm going to show you a way to use the knotweed that requires no cooking skill whatsoever. Is you can just take those little knotweed pieces that are hollow and fill them with like a, a, a strawberry cream cheese or a salmon mousse or something like that. You have a tart little edible container. It's a, a great way to use the plant. Requires no cooking skill whatsoever. All right, yes? You could have got the guy too by saying... There's native strawberries. <laughs> yeah, they're not available at the same time no, as the knotweed. Right? right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, but all right. When you cut the knotweed, does that kill the plant? Is that why? No. Okay. Unfortunately, it kind of it. no. It doesn't help it. It doesn't hurt it. It's complete. The knotweed doesn't care one way or the other. Okay. All right. No. Uh, I can't say that harvesting invasive species to eat them is an effective control measure because it isn't. So, but my attitude about invasives are if the ecologists remove them, fine, but in the meantime, if they're in our landscape and they're edible, I'm going to eat them, I'm going to teach other people about them. All right, so. I just wanted to tell people that Japanese knotweed is supposed to be a cure for uh, cancer. Uh, right, yeah, go see Stefan Brown at uh, Great Cape Burbs in Brewster and he can tell you all about that. All right, so anyway, um, all right, so with that snow-capped mountain in the background, I did not take this photo on Cape Cod. I will admit to that. All right, that's actually Mount Washington. So this is the view in North Conway on Route 16 after you've run the outlet mall gauntlet and what you see as you're looking north toward uh, the presidential range. But the point of the photo is to talk to you about dandelions. Dandelions are probably responsible for turning more people off of eating wild plants than anything else. And the story usually goes like, like this. Is it spring? You look out in your yard, you see a bunch of dandelions blooming, you say, oh, I heard dandelions are edible. I should try them. So you pick a few leaves, you bring it indoors, you put a little oil and vinegar on them, you take a bite. It's incredibly bitter. You spit it out and you say, yuck, I'm never going to eat a wild plant again, which is a real shame because dandelions are great if you eat the right part at the right time. So what is that and when is that? Well, in my opinion, when you start seeing whole fields turning yellow from dandelion flowers, it's really too late to be eating dandelions then. So I like to harvest them before they bloom and my favorite part are the flower buds, so the unopened flowers tucked into the base of the plant like that. So once again in the Boston area, it's around the first week of May when it's at this stage. And dandelion flower buds are among my favorite vegetables, period. Cultivated or wild, they're like a cross between corn, spinach, artichokes, and Brussels sprouts. <laughs> so they're really good, and all I'll do is just um, pick the buds off the plants and then uh, wash them, just put them in a bucket of water, wash them and get a pot of water boiling in the stove, throw the dandelion buds in there, cook them for 60 seconds, that's it. And then they're done and you can incorporate them into soups or omelets or casseroles, but before you do anything with them, before you put any butter or salt on them, just try them plain, I think you'd be amazed at how good they are. And if you want to eat dandelion leaves, this is the time of year to gather them. And so when I'm picking the buds off the plants, if I see any tender leaves in there, I'll just harvest them and use them and prepare them the same way. What about the flowers? You can eat the flowers. I happen to like the buds better, but you can eat the flowers. Are they best fresh or any point of boiling them? Uh, the boiling dispels what little bitterness there is. It makes them very palatable. But you could eat them raw if you wanted to. You do not have to boil them. Okay. All right, so, yes? Could, could you speak about the health benefits of dandelion? Yeah, I won't get through my plants in the show if I'm I get sorry. bogged down talking about dandelions are extremely healthy for you. All right. I can just say that. All right, so anyway, yes? I use my dandelions with olive oil, vinegar, and garlic, and pepper, and salt. That sounds yummy. It's wonderful. Oh, good. All right. All right. But I don't like those as well with hair on there. Some of hair. Some of hair? Yeah, yeah. No, no, I don't pick any that have hair on them. No, no. Okay. All right, so violets are edible. The violet flowers are edible. Um, and the violet leaves are edible. Until the flowers go away, then the leaves aren't that good. And you can eat the leaves raw or cooked. And you can candy the violet flowers, uh, use them for decorations. Okay, so chicory is a plant you often see along the roadside. So the, the photo of the flowers is a little out of sequence because that's a summer flower, but it's a close relative of dandelions. 
And chicory flowers are edible. They have almost no flavor, so why eat them? Because food is an unusual color, food for food. And so it's fun to just snip the petals off and get them into a salad. And chicory leaves are edible in the spring or in the fall. So as the weather cools off, chicory leaves become edible again. They're too bitter in the hot weather. And then the root is probably the most well-known part of the plant that's used to eat, actually to drink, as you make a drink from it. You just roast the roots. This is all explained in my book. You roast the roots and grind it up and make a beverage from it. And it does taste very similar to coffee, especially if you usually drink your coffee with cream and sugar and you drink the chicory drink the same way. Flavor is really similar. One big difference is that chicory does not have caffeine in it. So if you're one of these people who says, what's the point of drinking it if there's no caffeine in it, then the chicory is just not going to cut it for you. <laughs> okay, here's chickweed. This is a spring or a fall wild edible, and it's uh, very mild tasting. I use it as a sprout substitute in a sandwich or a lettuce substitute in a salad. Daisies are edible, although the best tasting part on a daisy are the leaves before the flowers come out. You may not know how to recognize the plant then, so I'll try to teach that to you. So this is what you want to look like. This is the best yummy edible stage on a daisy before the flowers come out. And if you look at the, I, I apologize, it's a little out of focus, but the tops of the flower buds are flat and they have markings on them. It looks like the spokes of a bicycle wheel. So look for that, look for leaves that look like that attached to it. And I find daisy leaves to be really yummy, uh, so yummy that I've never cooked with them. I just put them in a salad. Okay, lamb's quarters, this is a really familiar farm and garden weed. And although the best time to find lots of the plant at this stage is in June, you can find it at this stage other times of the year, including uh, possibly now, especially in an organic farm when they'll you know, finish with, let's say, the peas, and before they use that spot again, there'll be lamb's quarter seed in there, and it'll just exuberantly come right up and be exactly at this stage. So you see the little white dust in the center of each plant that's not from the roadside or anything. That's a little mealy dust the plant produces on its own. It's one of the ways to help recognize the plant. It is related to spinach. It has more vitamins than spinach. You can use it exactly like spinach. All right, here's sheep sorrel. So this grows on Cape Cod because you have a lot of sour soil here. This is a diminutive cousin of the French garden sorrel. So you can use this the same way. So you can make a sorrel soup from it, a sorrel sauce from it. Then here's a completely unrelated plant with the same flavor called wood sorrel. And, um, and when I teach this one of my foraging walks, which is about 90% of the time because it's so uh, ubiquitous, um, I'll often hear somebody in the group say, oh yeah, that's clover. We used to eat that when we were kids. Well, it's not clover. It's not even distantly related to clover. And if you look at the flowers, you can see they don't look like clover flowers at all. And if you look carefully at the leaflets on this plant, you'll see they're heart-shaped. Clover leaflets are much more oval-shaped. Clover leaves are technically edible, but you really need multiple stomachs to digest them properly. So I don't <laughs> usually teach that to people. And this one, you can nibble on any tender part of the plant, including these guys right here, these are the seed capsules, so you'll see those on the wood sorrel plants this time of year, and they're juicy and succulent, you can eat those too. Now the chemical resp responsible for the sour flavor in wood sorrel and in the sheep sorrel I just showed you is a chemical called oxalic acid, which is not good to eat in huge amounts. Like if you ate a big salvo full of just that plant or just those plants, you could inhibit your body's ability to uptake calcium and you could irritate your stomach lining. But there's no reason to be unduly concerned about that chemical because it's present in a lot of conventional vegetables like beets and spinach and rhubarb. So as long as you're eating in moderation, it's perfectly fine, okay? Yeah. I picked some today and cooked it with red snapper. Oh, it's okay. Yeah, fish. that's a good idea. Yeah. yeah. All right, so here's a plant I found on the Cape. Uh, so there's two very closely related species. There's peppergrass and poor man's pepper, and they're hard to tell apart. You do not need to know how to tell them apart because they're edible exactly the same way. They have the exact same flavor. So it's a little flat seed pods that taste a lot like watercress because watercress is a cousin of the peppergrass. And the nice thing about the peppergrass, the one on the right, is that it has a really long season of availability. So you can find it at that stage from May until at least Thanksgiving. So here's a slide I took a number of years ago when I was doing a program uh, down on Monomoy Island. And the woman that was running the program was making these roast beef and borsan sandwiches to feed us for lunch. And the peppergrass was going right outside our meeting location. And so I said, why don't we pick some of this and add it to the sandwiches? And we did, and it was great. 
All right, so when I make stuff from wild ingredients, I'm not a purist about it. I don't insist that every single ingredient be wild. For example, when I make that strawberry knotweed pie, I don't have to use yak butter for the shortening. I can use regular butter, regular sugar, and the knotweed makes it a wild dish. But you can make a salad completely from wild ingredients, which is what this one is, except for the croutons. But I don't mean to deter you from just throwing a few violet flowers into a regular salad. You don't have to go extreme like I did here. But anyway, so let me tell you what's in this salad. So um, the yellow flowers, the wild mustard flowers that I referred to before, the blue flowers in there, the chicory flowers, then there's a chickweed and lamb's quarters and, and uh, chicory stuff like that bulking up the salad. And then the little red berries are partridge berries, and then the yellowish-orange tomato-like things are ground cherries. Okay, so here's partridge berry. And, um, and this one you see often under pine trees, although probably more off the cape than on the cape. Now these berries have virtually no flavor. So why eat them? Because they're pretty. So I'll just put a few on top of a salad just to add that color in there. And then the ground cherries. So this is a plant you're typically gonna see where there's some kind of current or former farm going on, where there's a sort of a farmy, cultivated type. So I'll see them in places like that or horse paddocks. Occasionally they'll escape to other areas, but that's where I typically find them. And, uh, and this is a tomato-like relative, so this one's also a little out of chronological sequence, so you don't really see the fruits producing on ground cherries until at least the second half of the summer. And then what happens is the fruit uh, forms in this uh, calyx, this guy right here, if you can see that, it's a husk that surrounds the developing fruit. So you cannot ever see the fruit unless you pull that calyx off. So there are poisonous lookalikes, tomato-like plants that grow wild, that have little yellow fruits on them, uh, that taste horrible, so you, you'd know it was the wrong thing. But anyway, um, but the ground cherry always has that husk surrounding the fruits. So you see I peeled it off here to see the little yellow fruit, and it tastes like a sweet cherry tomato. They're really nice. The poisonous ones are nightshade? Uh, well, they're all in the nightshade family. Oh, okay. Right. Okay, so this plant um, is a good one to look for in the Cape because you can see it um, near the ocean just growing in the, in the gravelly business that's just beyond the rack line, the highest high tide line. Anybody know what this plant is? All right, it's a hard one. Very good. You get a gold star. This is evening primrose. So if I showed you the flower, you might have known what it is. So yeah. evening primrose is a biennial, which means it has a two-year life cycle. So the first year, in the very beginning of the second year, it just forms a rosette like that. <laughs> and that's the right time. If you want to harvest the root, that's the right time to get it, is you just yank on that rosette and you'll get a root out. And the root looks like that. So it's a big uh, white taproot with some pink coloration near the top. So, um, all right, so eating primrose is a biennial. It's got a two-year life cycle. So the second year, it uses up the energy in that root to produce the tall flower stalk, which can be this tall or even taller, with a, a lemon yellow colored flower. And then it goes to seed and then the whole plant dies. That's a life cycle for an evening primrose. So if you want to harvest the root, you want to get it between the first and second growing seasons. That's when the max amount of food energy is going to be in there. So, um, so, so far, my favorite way to use evening primrose is to make pancakes from it, like potato pancakes. So you can take whatever potato pancake recipe you normally use and use an equivalent amount of the grated evening primrose root instead of the potato. It should come out good. Okay, so here's another biennial plant. This one um, is at this stage, this time of year, and you, you may not have realized that you encountered this plant to get home, and here it is caught in your socks or in your dog's fur. These burrs, it's a plant called burdock. And the guy who invented Velcro did get the idea from these burrs, by the way. So this is a wonderfully edible plant, not this stage, but several other parts of the plant are edible. So burdock is a biennial. So uh, this is what it looks like at the beginning of the second year. So at this stage, you could still eat the root, or you could eat the root toward the latter half of the first year, it would be fine. Unfortunately, you can't yank on burdock foliage and get the root out, they will break on you. So you have to dig them up, which is a lot of work, and I don't usually bother. And the roots are huge. And I pretty much guarantee that if you try to dig one up, your patience will give out before the root will, because it'll just keep going and going and going. And at some point, you just say, all oh, the heck with it, you slice off what you have with your shovel, and you might have a length of root about that long. Now at that stage, uh, all you need to do is just uh, wash it off and cut it into half inch thick rounds. A very easy way to prepare it is just boil it like that for about 15 minutes and it will taste like a starchy artichoke. 
But as I said, I'm too lazy to do that. Instead, what I do is I harvest the plant at this stage. So this is the second year growth as the cylindrical flower stalk is beginning to grow from the center of the plant. Uh, when it's about a foot or maybe a foot and a half tall, I'll cut it at ground level and that's the part that I'll eat. So here on the left you see that um, it took me less than a half an hour to gather all those burdock stalks. So it's much faster than digging the roots up. Now you have to peel the very outer layer of a burdock stalk because it's bitter and stringy, so you need to trim that part off. But unlike the knotweed, the burdock stalks are solid all the way through, so after you trim the outer part off, you have a lot of food left over. So at that stage, you can just slice those in half inch thick rounds and boil them in salted water till they're tender, which is about five minutes. And then um, it's a fine vegetable, just plain, or it's really good in spaghetti sauce, or it's really good in the dish. I'm sure a lot of you have eaten if you haven't made it yourself. It's a dish where ordinarily you take artichoke hearts and Parmesan cheese and mayonnaise and breadcrumbs and you mix it all together and you bake it in the oven. It's a spread that you put on crackers. Well, you can substitute the boiled burdock flour stock rounds for the artichoke hearts and that recipe works great. And that recipe is on my webpage. So on the handouts that you all have at the bottom of those handouts, you'll see where to find me on the internet. And if you click on those links, that's where you can um, uh, get to my recipe page and you'll find the recipe for the dish I just described as well as a bunch of other things. Isn't burdock also good to fight diabetes? Burdock, I can't talk about specific ailments because I don't know about that one, but what I can say is that burdock has a principle in it which makes you healthier just to eat it. So more than just treating a specific ailment, it just raises your, oops, sorry, it just raises your overall level of well-being. It heals the liver. Yeah. So, so plants, yeah, plants that tend to, you know, if you hear something is good for diabetics, it tends to be high in inulin, which is a complex carbohydrate, like chicory is high in inulin, drew some artichoke, which I'm going to get to later in the show, are high in inulin. And it's, be, it's just, it, 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 it requires less of a rush on the insulin demand of the body when you eat things like that. Yeah. Okay? Comfrey? No, don't eat comfrey. And comfrey doesn't grow wild anyway. I'm happy to say. All right, this is a plant you all should know. You spend any time trying to bushwhack on Cape Cod. I'm sure you've uh, uh, launched a few epithets at this plant. So anyway, it is an edible plant. So this is, whoops, sorry. I'll go back to that in a second. So this is a plant called cat briar. And uh, Smilax rotundifoli, which means round leaf in Latin. And the edible part are the tender growing tips in the spring. So they're not out now, but in the spring, all this is very soft and supple. You see the tendrils coming out there. So the stem, the leaves, even the thorns, you can easily push in with your fingers. Just snap that tender part off and just pop it right in your mouth that has kind of a tart flavor. So this one, although it is a native species, you don't have to hold back in harvesting the cat briar. There's plenty out there, you know, harvest all that you want. Okay, a plant that, that isn't as common, but it does grow in the Cape, and I like better, is this plant, which is called carrion flower. So this is a... Uh, uh, thornless herbaceous cousin of the cat briar and in the spring it grows straight up and it looks an awful lot like asparagus and you harvest it like asparagus you snap, snap the top part of the shoot off and then you cook it like asparagus it tastes like asparagus it's related to asparagus so why is it called carrion flour mm -hmm. so um, so here we are cooking some up on a camping trip and uh, we're using a frisbee as a plate but I want to show you <laughs> that right here see these little guys right here so those are the flower buds. If we had waited like a week longer when those flowers were actually blooming, this plant would be relatively repulsive because then it smells like rotting meat or dirty gym socks. That's why it's called carrion flower. But if you eat it before it blooms, it's yummy. It does grow in Cape Cod. All right, so this is a plant that is all over the Cape and it has one edible stage and that's the flowers and those flowers are available for just about a two to three week period around Memorial Day or maybe slightly later on Cape Cod. And that's your window to get this plant. But then you should all be eating, because it's an invasive species, so eat all you want. So this is a plant called black locust. And, um, and the ecologists don't like to see it on the Cape because it does what plants in the pea family do, is it has the nitrogen fixing nodules on its root systems, and so it's adding nitrogen to the soil. 
And what they're worried about is you have rare plants on Cape Cod that have evolved with nutrient-poor soil. And they've learned how to cope with that. And if the black locusts are making the soil rich, they're altering the soil chemistry. Sorry, I keep hitting the microphone. Uh, so that's, but in the meantime, as I say, as long as this plant is out here, you might as well be stuffing your face with it. So these flowers are really good. They taste like sweet pea pods. So you can eat them just plain right off the tree if you want. Or uh, you can eat, put them into salads. You can cook with them. So, um, so yeah, you strip them off their central stalks and then uh, they go into the salad. Or a really good way to use them is to make fritters from them. And so there's the black locust fritters. So that's a recipe in my book. And um, okay, so you might be saying to yourself, boy, this is great, black locust fritters. I, I can't wait to try this, but I have this cousin or a friend that I would blow his or her socks off if I could serve this to them, but they're not visiting me till September or November, so how do I do it? Well, what you can do is in May, when those flowers are out, you can harvest them, strip them off their central stalks, and then put them in a freezer bag and freeze them, and then make the fritters from the frozen flowers whenever you want, and those fritters should be at least as good as the ones you make from the fresh flowers. Okay, yes? You know that black locust after Hurricane Bob moved the second time in Truro. Oh yeah, the, the, <laughs> that's an interesting story. Yeah, so you had two two opportunities to eat it then that year. All right, so here's pokeweed, and pokeweed is a Native American plant, but it's relatively common, so uh, you can harvest what you want. Now let me uh, let me just go to the next slide. So that's pokeweed at the edible stage. Okay, so this is around the same time the black locust flowers are out. So, um, and there's a chapter in pokeweed in my book with a good recipe there. Um, critical thing is you want to harvest the plant when it's like four to 10 inches tall, and when it's taller than that, that's too late. It's already not safe to eat. Now what's not safe to eat about it? It's a chemical called phytolacin, which is a purgative. So, um, it's very present in the mature plants, so the pokeweed plants that are out now that have those juicy big purple berries has lots of phytolacin in The root always has lots of phytolacin in So um, phytolacin in very minute doses could actually be possibly therapeutic for you, but if you eat too much of it, it's gonna make everything on the inside of your body want to get to the outside of your body through every available means as quickly as possible. So it's pretty nasty. So, um, so just stick to the shoots and even at this stage, you want to boil them for seven minutes, pour off the water, uh, but the pokeweed shoots will not shrink or get all mushy on you even after all that boiling. All right, so. <clears throat> Very thorough. No. Okay. okay, so, all right, you're seeing that shoot and you're saying, okay, Russ says it's yummy, but that's not a very distinctive looking thing. How would I know that's a pokeweed shoot? Well, the plant does you an immense favor I'm about to teach you, and that is, so those of you that know this plant, know the plant with the purple berries on there, okay, so that plant is going to succumb to the frost when the cold weather eventually comes, but it does not disappear. The stem will persist as a skeleton all the way through the winter into the following spring and will still be there when the shoots for the next year's growth comes up. So you see right here, so there's last year's pokeweed plant, and right at the same exact spot, that's where the pokeweed shoots are coming from. So look for that, and then you know for sure you've got the pokeweed. Okay? All right, so milkweed's edible. There's a chapter in my book on milkweed. There's uh, at least four edible stages to the plant, and they happen chronologically in succession. So if you miss up and misses, you mess up and miss a stage, you just wait a while till the next edible stage shows up. So uh, anyway, so this is stage number three. Actually, the flower buds, when they're in a nice tight green cluster, use the exact same cooking method for any milkweed part that you're eating as the pokeweed, so I will boil these for seven minutes, and like the pokeweed, the plant will not shrink or get all mushy on you. By the way, this is the common milkweed, is the only one that's edible, so swamp milkweed, butterfly weed, none of the other Asclepius genus plants are edible as far as I know. All right, and uh, so those buds over on the right side of the photo, those have been boiled for seven minutes. They almost look better than they did when they were on the plant. So, uh, so that's my point, it holds up really well, so don't worry about boiling it. Okay, and the pods are edible, so when they're an inch long or smaller and nice and firm to the touch, the flavor and the texture is really similar to green beans, and you boil them for seven minutes, as I said before. All right, but there is the monarch butterfly caterpillar in the photo to remind us that this is indeed one of the plants the monarch butterflies seek out to lay their eggs on, and the caterpillars uh, eat the leaves and so on. 
And, uh, and probably all or most of you have heard the stories, the distressing stories about the decline in the monarch populations. And I've been assured by several ecologists that the foragers are not responsible for this, that you know there's several potential causes, but it looks like the leading cause is as the butterflies are migrating north from their wintering grounds in Mexico, they're flying through the lower Mississippi Valley and places like that with a widespread adoption of the Roundup Ready corn and soybeans. So they plant this genetically modified crops and the crops can handle all the glyphosate they're spraying on them, but it kills off all the milkweed. So the monarchs are having trouble finding milkweed to lay their eggs on as they're migrating north to get here. So anyway, even so, I, don't, I, I want to you know, help the milkweed and make sure there's a lot of it around for me to nibble on and for the monarchs to nibble on too. So uh, it's a plan I'm actively propagating in my nursery and I'll get to more details about that at the end of the show. But even if all you did is if you're traveling around you know, pretty soon, you'll begin to see the ripe monarch pods split open and then you see the little uh, uh, parachute business sticking out that's attached to the seeds. You see a nice healthy colony of that. You could just gather some and as you're traveling around, you see a nice habitat for the milkweed that doesn't have any. You could just release the parachutes and help start a new colony. Okay, this is a plant I hope you all know. It's all over Cape Cod. This is sassafras. This is a, a, a plant that uh, is indigenous to the eastern seaboard and the Gulf of Mexico. And uh, it's a plant that the early European explorers to the New World got very excited about because they had never seen a plant like this. So they presented it with a lot of fanfare to the royal courts to impress the royalty and help justify the monarchs that were shelling out these enormous sums to uh, support these uh, overseas expeditions. So uh, for a while there was a craze in Europe on sassafras and, and people were very excited about it. There was a demand for sassafras so they would sail ships empty to the New World with the sole purpose of filling them up with sassafras and sending them back. And one of those ships was captained by a guy named Bartholomew Gosnold who was the guy who named Martha's Vineyard after his daughter. He was here in 1602 on a sassafras gathering expedition. So anyway, so, uh, so sassafras was very popular and it developed this reputation as being kind of a, the ginseng of its day, a panacea it was supposed to be good against all these ailments. And so all these tea houses sprung up and people would drink the sassafras tea and so on. Well, then a reputation developed that sassafras was good against syphilis and people stopped drinking it in public because nobody wanted anybody else to think that they had syphilis. So that was it for the uh, public drinking of sassafras. So anyway, uh, there's two different flavors in sassafras. So there's a flavor in the root and there's a flavor in the upper part of the plant. So the root is what's used to, oh, um, I buried the lead as a journalism would say. Okay, you all know how to recognize sassafras. It's exceedingly easy. The plant has leaves with three different shapes on the same plant. No thumbs, one thumb, and two thumbs on the same plant. All right? So anyway, um, okay, so the root is one of the edible parts. It's actually the bark on the outside of the root that you peel and... Um, and you can uh, make a tea from it just by simmering it in, in uh, hot water. Uh, and um, now I should say that uh, about a half a century ago, several studies were done where they fed rats an immense amount of an essential oil called saffron, which is in the sassafras root bark. And some of those rats got cancer and the Food and Drug Administration found out about that. So they banned sassafras from the commercial food supply, actually saffron containing sassafras in the commercial food supply. And that rule is still in effect today. So as far as I know though, that study was based on rats and I'm not aware of any studies or any data which shows people getting cancer from sassafras. Having said that though, if you're one of those people who says, you know, I don't care if there's any possibility there could be anything potentially carcinogenic to me, I'm gonna stay away from this plant and I totally support you in that decision. In fact, I totally support you in wherever you feel like you wanna draw your line where you start to become uncomfortable. You're not sure you've recognized the right thing. You're not sure you've collected it from a clean site. Uh, you're not sure you prepared it the right way and you just check it out and you don't eat it. I think that's pretty sensible. So anyway, uh, but I have eaten this one, it's very tasty. In my book, there's a recipe for sassafras candy, which is like the root beer barrels you used to buy at the penny candy store, only even better because there's little bits of root bark embedded in the candy. All right, so that's one part of the plant that's edible. And then the leaves are used to make filet powder. So if you've ever heard of filet powder, filet powder is made from dried powdered sassafras leaves. That's what filet powder is. And so uh, you gather the leaves when they're small, like when they're about an inch long, and just dry them, pulverize them, and then put that 
powder into a salt or pepper type shaker and then add it to your food at the end to flavor and thicken it. All right, and there's no saffron of any significant amount, but leaves, so you don't have to worry about that issue. All right, and I like to talk about sassafras because it's a really underappreciated fall foliage plant. You probably all know that out here, but you know, back in the mainland, I, I think people are pretty clueless about that. All right, so um, there are two basic varieties of tilia that you're gonna run into um, here in Massachusetts. There's the tilia americana, which is the native American basswood, and there's tilia cordata, which is the little leaf linden, which is planted a lot as a street tree in the city. Either way, it's edible the exact same way, is you can make a, uh, you can eat the leaves raw when they're uh, young, and then you can make a tea from the flowers when the flowers are out, and the flowers are out around the first day of summer. And the flowers are a very nice fragrance, it's kind of a lemon and honey fragrance, and the tea is very tasty. And uh, it has two medicinal uses in addition to the uh, edibility of the plant. So it's um, soothing to your digestive system and to your mental state at the same time. So it's very highly regarded tea in Europe for that reason, okay? All right, so here's a plant called amelanchier or a juneberry or a shadbush or a serviceberry or a saskatoon, all the same species, genus amelanchier. And uh, there are eight, at least eight different species in New England and they're hard to tell apart and they hybridize and you don't need to know them to how to tell them apart because they're all edible. Here in Truro, I've seen a very diminutive one that doesn't seem to get taller than about three feet tall that's growing kind of like, like where the beach plums might like to grow, you know, in very sandy substrate. Uh, but the fruit is delicious. So, but this is a great time to spot the plants when they're blooming in the spring because they these large five petal flowers. Remember that spot where you see it blooming and then in June or out here in the Cape, it might be July, you want to look for the fruit and the fruit looks like this. It's purple. Purple is kind of a hard color to see at a distance. So it's good to know where the plants are ahead of time. And then uh, the fruit looks an awful lot like blueberries, but they really don't taste like blueberries. They taste like a cross between uh, cherries and almonds. And they're fun for stuffing your face right by the tree, or you can make stuff from them, uh, especially muffins. There's a Juby muffin recipe in my book, or you can um, uh, make dry the berries and make granola with them and stuff like that. All right, and mulberries are ripe at the same time, and so I would like to mix juneberries and mulberries to make strudel. All right, so wild strawberries, um, this is a plant that uh, not only do I love to find in the wild, but I'm ap actively propagating this plant from seed and then planting it just so there's more wild strawberries out there. And I encourage you all to do the same, especially if you've got any grassy areas near your house. Uh, this is a plant that can definitely stand being mowed, being stepped on, doesn't mind at all. And you can diversify your lawn with something edible that the pollinators will appreciate too. So. It doesn't mind sandy soil at all, so uh, that would be an excellent choice. Um, and besides the uh, berries, which are really yummy, um, you can make tea from the leaves too when the leaves are fresh or thoroughly dried. Apparently when the leaves are wilted, they're slightly toxic, but fresh or thoroughly dried is fine. And the tea you make from the leaves does taste at least vaguely like the fruit, and it does have vitamin C in it. So if you felt a case of scurvy coming on, you could rush out and make yourself some strawberry leaf tea. All right, so here's jewelweed. So this plant is at the edible stage right now. Uh, and don't wait too long because when you start to get the very cold nights, this plant's very sensitive to cold and it'll start to disappear right away. So you want to encounter it now while it's still out there. So um, let me just mention the medicinal use of this plant uh, is um, you, you don't uh, consume it, you take it topically. And it's a, it has been clinically proven to cure poison ivy for some people. I'm apparently not one of those people, but it does, you know, I do know that it works for some people. And so you take the entire plant, it's juicy, succulent plant, scrunch it up, get the juice out, and then rub that juice on a place where you either have poison ivy or where you think you're exposed to poison ivy. And if you want that remedy available year round, what you can do is just throw the plants in a blender or in a pot and boil it up and take that liquid and pour it into ice cube trays and freeze it. And then you can just take an ice cube and put that on your skin. And some people claim that the jewelweed juice is good for all kinds of other skin irritations, including athlete's foot. All right, but the edible part are the ripe seeds. And the ripe seeds are in the seed pods that look like that. The tricky part is when those seed pods are ripe, 
they detonate as they'll explode at the slightest touch. So this plant is called touch me not because if you brush against the plant when the ripe seed pods are on there, they just go, psh, 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 psh. they shoot all over the place. So if you want to eat those seeds, what you need to do is sneak up on one of those seed pods and grab it and have it explode in your hand. Don't worry, it won't hurt. Okay, so there's a ripe seed pod right there. Okay, that's what the flowers look like. So there's the seed pod right there. And, you know, it's just occurring to me that you might be able to see these slides better if the lights weren't so bright. I'm sorry, I just figured that out. Yeah, Galen, can you turn them down at all? You're going to try. Is that better? Okay, sorry. <laughs> Somebody should have said something. All right. Is that, is that good enough? Okay, all right. Okay, so, all right, so, yeah, so there's, there's, so you can see, you can see right through there, this is right about to explode. And what I do is I look at the angle between the stem and the seed pod. You see how this angle is 90 degrees? Okay, so it's 90 degrees, it's ready to go. If it's bigger than that, like 120 or bigger than that, it's not ready to go. It's got to be a sharp, sharp right angle like that. All right, so grab it, have it explode in your hand, and then it'll do all this business. And then uh, letter D are the ripe seeds, and if you eat them, they taste just like walnuts, like store-bought English walnuts. They're teeny, you know, so it's hard to imagine collecting enough to really do something with, but it's a fun nibble as you're going along the trail, it's fun. And another cool thing you can do with those seeds, you don't need to do this to eat them, but just to see is if you gently rub the outer seed covering off a ripe jewelweed seed, the inner color, letter E here, is this beautiful bright robin's egg blue color. And I have no idea why that color is in there, because no creatures ever see it. It's just one of those unexplained mysteries of Mother Nature. All right, purslane, so um, this is a, um, a very common farm and garden weed that uh, won't show up until the onset of the hot weather in the summer. And then um, uh, it's edible raw, it's edible cooked, any above ground tender part of the plant's edible. Uh, and um, it's high in iron and omega-3 fatty acids. It's very good for you too. Now, I'm going to teach you a way to use the purslane that requires no cooking skill whatsoever. Is you can just take the purslane leaves and put it into a gazpacho. And you don't even have to make the gazpacho. You could go to the store and buy the gazpacho and then just throw the purslane leaves in there. And the texture of the purslane wor works really well in a gazpacho. All right, so here's black raspberry. So uh, this grows here and there in the Cape. And this plant does a big favor for you is it shows you, it discloses its location during the off season. So if you're out in the Cape and it's, you know, December, February, April, whenever, and you see the canes with that purpley color on them, that's what black raspberries do. Remember that spot and go back in July to get the fruit. All right, and uh, I don't need to tell you what to do with black raspberry fruit. I'm sure you can figure that out on your own. It's the same deal with the black raspberry leaves and actually any leaf in the rubus genus is you can make tea from, like I was describing for the wild strawberries. So fresh or thoroughly dried leaves um, you can use for tea. And um, two medicinal values of those teas I know of is that res red raspberry tea has a good reputation for women because it tones the uterine wall, so pregnant women will take it for that purpose. And then blackberry leaf tea is supposed to be good for constipation and diarrhea, which is a pretty neat trick that it's good at both ends of the spectrum there. All right. So, so this is a native species. It's fairly common. As I said, foraging for fruit is a relatively benign foraging activity, so I don't worry too much about picking the fruit. When you're picking black raspberry fruits, typically there are unripe fruits on the plant still. You're not going to be out there every single minute picking every single fruit as soon as it becomes ripe. So there'll be enough fruit for animals and stuff like that. But the next plant I'm going to teach you, pick all you want. And that's this guy the wine berry, all right? This is an invasive species, so a guilt-free foraging opportunity. And, um, and uh, this one we don't have in the Boston area because it's a little bit too cold up there for it, but here in the Cape it exists. And as you go further south and west, like uh, uh, Buzzards Bay and Long Island Sound and Lower Hudson Valley, you're gonna encounter more of it. And, uh, and I've heard an interesting theory about how the wine berries got here because this is a plant from China. And the theory is that the whalers in their worldwide expeditions encountered the plant in China, liked it, and brought it home and planted it in this area because where this plant grows are places that had a whaling industry. So, sounds plausible to me. So, um, 
I have to I'll have to say for my personal taste, I think that red raspberries have a more interesting flavor than wineberries, but it's hard to top a wineberry for its gorgeousness. It's really a beautiful fruit. And that gorgeousness will stand up even after you freeze the fruit. So um, I'm sure a lot of you know this trick is that you pick a bunch of fresh fruit and you spread it out in a single layer in a cookie sheet, stick that in the freezer, and once it freezes, you can store it in a freezer bag, whatever. And so this wineberry flan that was made from the frozen fruit, you know, that's the, the fruit is like, uh, you know, four, four months old. And you see how well it holds up. Okay, so black cherry, this grows all over the Cape. And the cherries vary in flavor from uh, tree to tree. Sometimes they're puckery and astringent, not very good at all. And then occasionally you'll find some that are really sweet and yummy, uh, just about as good as domesticated cherry. The one downside for these fruit, though, is they are small. There's no getting around that. Uh, black cherries will approach but not quite get to a half an inch in diameter, and the pits aren't that much smaller than conventional cherry pits. So I wouldn't recommend... Um, using black cherries for any recipe that require pitting each individual fruit because that would be exceedingly tiresome. So what I'll do if I don't just stuff my face by the tree is I'll just pick the fruit and put it in a pot with some water and simmer it for a while and then put everything through a food mill or a sieve and then the pits are held back and the pulp and the juice goes through and that's a raw material you can use for making uh, jams, jellies, fruit soups, cordial, stuff like that. Last thing I'll say about black cherries is the only part of this plant that's edible are the ripe fruit. There's nothing else edible on a black cherry. In fact, most of the rest of the plant has a chemical in it which is metabolized into cyanide by the body. Now, I have heard of people making their own cough syrup from black cherry bark. I guess if they had enough of it, they'd stop coughing. <laughs> All right, so if you do that, I hope you know what you're doing. Okay, so here's elderberry. This grows in the Cape. and. Um, and elder flowers are edible, and elder fruits are edible. And I'm just going to take a short detour in my talk to talk to you about one thing that's a little troubling. And, uh, and perhaps the amazing turnout for my talk is an indication of this. I've been teaching foraging for over 40 years. And most of the time, this is a relatively esoteric subject. You know, relatively few people are interested. But it seems like in the last 10 or 15 years, this stuff has gotten very trendy, and that uh, uh, makes me kind of uncomfortable about it. Um, now, when people are picking invasive species like the knotweed and the wineberry, that's fine, but um, where I get nervous is when I see native species becoming articles of commerce, and that, I think, is happening with this one. For example, several years ago, I get an email from a fancy produce store in the Boston area, and the email said, tell us where the elderberry plants are so we can pick the flowers and make the syrup we could sell at our store. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't tell them. I told them the kind of habitat the plants like to grow in, which is an open, sunny, meadowy, damp habitat. But I didn't want to tell them about a specific spot because I was too afraid they'd just go hammer it. So here is a scenario. Okay. Here's a scenario. I don't know if this has actually happened, but I think it's pretty plausible. Let's take some chef. He's really fixated on an elderflower, wants to put on the menu, and he says to somebody, hey, go out there, pick me 10 pounds of elderflowers. And this poor schnook is running around trying to find this plant and finally finds a bush like this with a lot of the flowers on there. And he looks at that bush and he says, you know, if I pick every flower off this bush, I can fill this order. And I don't have time to run around and find other elderberry plants. I gotta get back to the restaurant, which means no flowers gonna be left on that plant for any pollinators. No fruit is gonna form in that plant because you have to leave the, the flowers on the plant to get the fruit. So that's the impact that I worry about when I see things, you know, when wild plants have a financial value to them. So now, I don't want to deter you all from gathering a few elderflowers, you know, to cook yourself or to have a couple friends over, that's fine. It's just the commercial scale stuff that worries me. So I said to this um, uh, produce store, I said, you know, there's some really delicious invasive plants out there, like the black locust flower. It's really good. If you're going to commercialize wild plants, can I suggest that you move in that direction? And the response was, no, we want elderflower. Mm -hmm. So I said to them, well, then my advice is to get a farmer to grow it for you. Uh, because a farmer, you know, farmers often have wetlands in the edges of the field. They can't be growing conventional row crops there. They could put a row of elderberry plants in. And then if those flowers are all picked and they're going off to the restaurants, uh, it's, um, at least they're not uh, hammering the wild populations. But the subject makes me, sorry, the subject makes me very nervous. I am a complete conscientious objector from the whole food chef restaurant business. I don't deal with them at all uh, because of this whole issue, you know. So anyway... All right, so, um, so you can make a drink from the elderflowers, uh, an alcoholic drink, a non-alcoholic drink. 
Um, but I tend to just leave the flowers on the plant and wait for the uh, fruits to form. And let me say, some people will fry these flowers in fritter batter, but the black locusts make much tastier fritters, so just, just use them. Okay, so if you, uh, all right, let me, um, I, I don't want to harangue you too much on this subject, but I just want to underscore it just so I've made my point, all right? Remember at the beginning of the talk, I was talking about how animals rely on plants for all of some, on native species of all of some portion of their life cycle. So this critter right here, this is the elderberry boar beetle, this beautiful iridescent blue and gold beetle, spends virtually its entire life cycle associated with elderberry plants. So the adults mate on the elderberry bushes, female lays the eggs on it, the larvae live inside the elderberry plants, they're not harming the plants at all, the beetles and the plants have co-evolved for millennia, there's no harm there. So if all the flowers of the elderberry plants got picked and these plants began to stop reproducing in the wild and we started losing elderberry plants in the landscape, this beetle would be harmed from that. So that's just, okay, so I made my point about this, you, you, you get it. All right. all right, so let's talk back about eating things. All right, so, so when the elderberry fruit is ripe, it typically hangs upside down like that from the weight of the fruit. And I understand that you can get a stomach ache from eating too many raw elderberries, but if you dry them first, you cook them first, then they're perfectly fine. And I like to mix elderberries and apples together. So elderberry apple sauce, elderberry apple pie is better than just plain applesauce or apple pie. Okay, spice bush. Uh, this grows in the Cape. Uh, where you're typically going to find it is as an understory species uh, in a damp area underneath hardwood trees, often where there's some flowing water, like a perennial or ephemeral stream. So maybe, you know, the, the sandwich end of the Cape, you're gonna see more of it than, than out here. But anyway, it's here on the Cape Cod. And uh, this is one of the native species the colonists turned to to make tea from when they were boycotting the British tea during the Revolutionary War era. They would just steep the twigs in hot water. Uh, I like to gather the berries and I'll dry the berries and use them as a savory spice like Szechuan peppercorns or black pepper. Uh, but these berries are really important food for migrating waterfowl, so it's important to leave lots of them on the plants so the birds get all they need. All right, and here's another reason if you want to actually plant spice bush, spice bush and sassafras are the host plant for this really cool critter called the spice bush swallowtail caterpillar. And, uh, and that's really what they look like. I have these caterpillars on the sassafras and spice bush plants in my nursery, which is really fun. And um, now, so these are fake eye patches. This critter is trying to impersonate a snake and scare the birds away from eating it. All right. Okay, so. Those, those are not harmful to any other plants. They'll just stick to the spice. Yes, right, yeah. Okay, so uh, wintergreen, this is a very, very common plant on Cape Cod. And um, although if you were harvesting it and the leaves have the oil of wintergreen flavor in it, if you're gonna harvest it to make tea, there's no reason to yank out whole plants. Just pick a leaf or two from each plant, that's fine. Very common plant, native species, but it can stand that kind of harvesting. And the berries are edible too. They're uh, not very sweet, but they do have that wintergreen flavor in them. So if you make a tea from wintergreen leaves, the best way to do it is just to stuff a mason jar full of water uh, and stick the um, uh, and, and stick the stuff a whole bunch of leaves in there, and then just stick that whole thing out in the sun for a couple of days and make a sun tea from it. Because if you try to make wintergreen tea the normal way with the boiling water from the kettle, oil wintergreen is very volatile, which means your kitchen will smell great, but there'll be no flavor left in your teacup. So slow brew it that sun tea way to get a stronger flavored beverage. Now the oil of wintergreen, the chemical name for that is methyl salicylate and it is related to salicylic acid which is the active ingredient in aspirin so it does have a pain killing effect. So if you're hiking in the woods and you twisted your ankle, you could find some wintergreen leaves to chew on. At the very least it would distract you from the pain in your ankle. <laughs> Okay, so here is black huckleberry, also a very, very common plant on Cape Cod. And uh, I'm sure a lot of people pick these thinking they're blueberries, and there's no harm in that. They are closely related to blueberries. Uh, sometimes you find these in a little drier habitat than the blueberries like, and sometimes you'll find the fruits on these a little bit later in the season than the blueberries. And the flavor of a black huckleberry is a little waterier and a little seedier than a regular blueberry, but they're perfectly fine other than that. And then this one, um, I'm, I can't tell you a spot on the Cape where it grows, but it definitely grows in Southeast Mass. Uh, this is a blue huckleberry, and one nice thing about it is that this still has berries on it in September after Labor Day when just about every blueberry type thing is finished, this one's still out there. Oh, what did I do? Let me try to push that again. All right, there we go. All right, what is this plant? 
Oh, okay, good, good. I thought if they don't know what this plan is in Truro, I'm just going to give up. All right, so I mean, I did try to help showing you the boardwalk, going over the dune. All right, so, okay, maybe you all know this trick, but I suspect there are a few that don't, okay? If you want to find beach plums, look for them in May when the plants are blooming. That's the best time to spot them because when they're out now, beach plums, okay, so that's what the fruit looks like. Although there is an orange variety, I'll show you in just a second. Typically it's purple, and purple is a hard color to see at a distance, and you really need to be practically standing right next to the beach plum to see whether or not there's fruit on there. And the fruit tends to hide under the leaves a little bit. It's not sticking out on top of the plant or anything. So uh, you probably all know this, but beach plums vary in flavor from bush to bush. Sometimes they're puckery and astringent and not very yummy raw. You can still use them for jam or jelly. They'll be fine. But occasionally you can find beach plums that are really good, just plain, into your mouth, just about as good as a regular cultivated plum. I found some today in Dennis. Uh, although I have to say, when I, tell, when I advise people to look for beach plums, I say Labor Day weekend because we're already, they fruit in a bell curve, so it'll start in August and then the peak will be like just probably around the first of September and then it starts to tail off like that. So I found them as late as the first day of fall on Cape Cod, but you're really at the tail end at that point. So they're still out there, you can still pick them, but a week ago would have been better. Yes? Any advice on pruning them to encourage the crop next year? Oh, that's a great question. Yeah, that is a great question. Um, <coughs> Well, I'm going to give you a very uneducated answer, okay? And the answer is, these are native plants. You know, Mother Nature isn't out there pruning them in the wild, and yet some bushes, some wild bushes, seem to be very prolific and just produce very well. I, I understand, you know, I hear sometimes, oh, there's a great year for beech plums, there's a horrible year for beech plums. I personally haven't experienced that. You know, I've seen better years than others, but I've never seen any complete washout where there's no beech plums. I always find some. So last year I found more than this year, but there's still plenty this year. So I'm sorry I can't give you more educated advice than that. All right, so, um, all right, and beach plums do not have to grow near the ocean. I mean, that's kind of a, not important here in Truro, but you know, I found these plants growing in Worcester County, Massachusetts, in similar kind of sandy type substrate. And beach plums don't need to grow in sand either. So you could grow them whatever your yard, as long as you have sun and reasonably well draining soil, you could plant them. And, and as you may know, they're readily available from just about any nursery is gonna carry them here in the Cape. Or you can order them from Fedco Trees, which is where I get a lot of plants order them online, they ship you bare root in the spring, and uh, they're great that way. Okay, and here's the yellow-fleshed kind, which is much less common than the purple one, but this is around from time to time, so yeah, so this kind I found in Dennis, uh, let's see, a couple years ago, um, so, and, and they taste at least as good as the purple ones. All right, so there's beach peas, and beach peas are edible, and they sort of have two seasons in the spring, you'll find tender green pods of tender green peas in there. And in the fall, you'll find it too. And in the summer, it just gets too hot and they just you know, burn right out. But in the spring or the fall, you get the edible stage. And I say in moderation because there's this very uh, bizarre disease called latherism that is especially harmful to men because it paralyzes men from the waist down, all right? But this is something that you would only get uh, if you only ate beach peas. That's all you ate for a long time. All right, and so I assume that you're eating beach peas with pasta or something. If you eat it with anything else, you'd be fine. It would be if you, if you had a famine and all there were were beach peas, then you have to worry about it. If you're just eating with other things, don't worry about that. All right, so, um, all right, so that's my wife, Ellen, and we're out. This is actually in the West Coast. The beach peas that we have, it's more or less the same species all over the Northern Hemisphere. And um, now, I will say that if you grow the English garden shell peas, I wouldn't get particularly excited about beach peas because they're not quite as good. Uh, uh, but if you're at the beach and the beach peas are ripe, I think it's funner to be collecting beach peas than just sitting on a towel getting skin cancer. So I'd rather be gathering them. All right, this is a fun plant. This is called sea rocket. And it is related to the wild mustard I told you about before. But this one only grows just beyond the rack line, the highest high tide line. And it tastes a lot like wasabi. Uh, it's very, you know, strongly flavored like that. So you only need a little bit, a couple leaves to go into a salad, whatever. Uh, and I would encourage being abstemious. That means 
don't be a pig when you're harvesting this one because it can be not very common. And so one or two leaves per plant, that's okay, but I hope nobody's ripping out entire plants because there just isn't enough of it to harvest it that way. And as I say, it's very strong because you don't need very much. Are they the kind that make a flower? Yes, it's a pink flower, yeah. sort of pinky purple. Okay, then here's ORAC, and this one grows in a similar habitat uh, just beyond the rack line. It is related to the lamb's quarters I taught you before, only this is the maritime cousin. And, um, and there are some rare varieties of ORAC, so you have to be, once again, careful when you're harvesting it to uh, take just the tender tips off the plants. And I would say my experience, it's a little better earlier in the season than now. Uh, and although it's edible raw, it's really good cooked. Okay, here's glasswort, and this one you see in a similar habitat to maybe even closer into the actual salt marsh, you see this one. And this is another plant I've seen for sale at Whole Foods, and it has me concerned because I just am nervous about the way it's being harvested in an unsustainable way for people that need to make a quick buck. Uh, so, so anyway, so in reality, all you have to do is just pick the tender tips off the young plants and that's it, leave the plants in the ground, don't pick any more than that, and uh, make sure you're seeing a big patch before you harvest any. And then it will taste uh, like salty spinach, because it's actually a cousin of spinach. Yes? Are both the annual and the perennial edible? Um, as far as I know, yes, okay. yeah. Okay, so there's a bunch of edible seaweeds, and I'll go through a couple of them right now. So let's talk about dulse, which uh, I tend to see uh, in areas that have a rockier coastline than Cape Cod, so maybe a little bit more on the North Shore of Boston and further north from there than down here, but occasionally you'll see it here, uh, especially if a storm washes it off a rock and it washes up on the beach. So this one will look like a flat maroon hand, and the texture raw isn't very good, but when you dry it, it remains soft and pliable, and it's delicious just straight into your mouth. It has kind of a briny flavor. Uh, or you can chop it up and use it in omelets or soups, anything you want that briny flavor in. That's uh, the dulse. And uh, up in Grand Manan Island in New Brunswick, they serve it like chips and salsa on the table at the restaurants. Okay, now here's a shot from Martha's Vineyard. So here's a woman who, for a party that I was involved in many years ago where people brought wild ingredients, um, uh, dishes made from wild ingredients, she made this blanc mange. So this is a pudding that you make from Irish moss. And Irish moss contains carrageen in it, and basically you just put the Irish moss in a cheesecloth bag and you suspend it in the milk as you're simmering it on the stove and give the bag a squeeze and then the carrageen comes out. Pull the Irish moss out. You could eat that Irish moss seaweed if you want. It's perfectly edible. But in general, what people do is just use it as the gelling agent and then when the uh, milk is cooling, you put in your flavors and stuff and then you have this pudding, this beautiful thing like what she made there. Okay, now um, this is an exception to the rule that I was telling you before where I get nervous is when, when wild plants end up on menus. This one I hope will end up on menus. This is an invasive seaweed called Codium fragile or you might know it by its common names, green fleece or dead man's fingers or oyster thief. <laughs> Okay, so this is a seaweed from Asia that has made itself at home here in the Cape and the Islands, and um, it's edible. They make a kimchi from it in Korea. Uh, when I did a program on the vineyard a few years ago, I suggested that the chefs could do a codium cook-off out there. Yeah. It's just start to experiment with this plant and see the different ways they could pickle it or ferment it or just try different things with it. And if they could come out with some really yummy ways to use it, then put it on the menu. And the more this plant is harvested, the better off the environment is. But as I say, that's a big exception to the normal thing where I get really worried about wild plants showing up in restaurant menus. Okay, so here is the beach rose. And let me just go ahead and say, okay, I won't ask for hands, but I have heard that some people think these are beach plums. Okay, well good, you guys are smart. But believe it or not, more than once people said, oh yeah, beach plums, I know what they are. There's those big red things with the pink flowers. Beach plums, right? No, but they are related to beach plums. They are edible, so that's good. All right, so let's just go back to the flower. All right, so all roses are edible, whether it's a garden rose or wild rose. 
Um, I tend to like the Rosa rugosa just because it's a non-native species. It was introduced in Japan in the 19th century, and it has naturalized itself along the coast, so you can, don't have to worry about ecological implications of picking it. Although, it is a beautiful plant, and so I might not pick it in a place where people are walking through the dunes just to enjoy the beautiful roses you know, because then I'm taking that experience away from them. But if you're in an out-of-way location where people aren't really seeing the plants, then yeah, you can harvest it. And um, so with the Rosa rugosa, it's got the beautiful, usually magenta colored flowers. You can use those petals for decorating other foods or making rose petal jam, rose petal jelly. Rose water is made from uh, rose petals. Use that Middle Eastern cooking. Uh, and then the rose hips, you can um, uh, use rose hips to make rose hip tea from fresh or dried hips, rose hip jam, rose hip jelly, rose butter, stuff like that. And the rose rugosa rose hips that's here on the right, um, they're very good, uh, just fresh into your mouth. What you need to do though is cut each one down the center and scrape out all the seeds and all the irritating little hairs that are packed with those seeds because that would be very irritating to your mouth if you ate them. Get all that out and then what you have left you can eat. And a good rose hip tastes like a cross between an orange, an apple, and a strawberry. And it's an extremely concentrated source of vitamin C. One cupful of rose hips with the seeds scraped out of the center can give you as much vitamin C as 12 dozen oranges. Huh? All right. Okay, so bayberry is edible. Um, not the berries, but the leaves. Use them like bay leaves in cooking. All right, sweet fern um, is another plant that the colonists turned to to make tea during the Revolutionary War era. They would just steep those leaves in hot water for a few minutes. Sweet goldenrod. This is really fun. You've got a lot of this on Cape and grows down in Buzzards Bay, too. It's a licorice-flavored goldenrod, another plant the colonists made tea from. This is a plant that I'm propagating from seed in my nursery, and it's very easy to grow, and it really does taste like licorice, so you can make a licorice-flavored tea from it. Okay, Monarda fistulosa, another plant I'm growing from seed, and this one I've seen on the Cape. Um, Wild mints vary in flavor. Um, they fall into two basic categories, the sweet and the savory category, and this fits into a savory category. So these leaves are very similar to oregano. So you'd use these leaves for like a pizza topping, sausage making, soups, casserole, stuff like that. Rose mallow, this is a plant I haven't done a lot of culinary experimentation with, but it's in the mallow family, which is entirely edible. So it includes the family, the, the plant marshmallow. You ever wonder why marshmallows have that weird name? Because they used to be made from a plant called the marshmallow, which is actually a plant from Europe, but this plant is related to that. And so the flowers, it's a hibiscus, so you can make tea, I guess, from the flower petals like they do with regular hibiscus. And this one I've seen growing right next to the Phragmites, right next to the purple loosestrife. It's a native species, another plant I'm propagating from seed and planting out in the landscape. Okay, I finally got to the mushrooms. All right, so anyway. So this species of mushroom, this is the sulfur shelf or the chicken mushroom, and this is way at the safe end of the line. There are no poisonous lookalikes to this mushroom. There is an edible lookalike. I'll teach you in just a second. All right, so how do you tell this mushroom apart? Uh, Galen, can you turn the lights completely off right now? I think it's going to help with the color on this one. Uh, okay, all right. So you see the top of the mushroom is pumpkin orange color. The underside, this underside color right here, this is sulfur yellow, like chemistry class sulfur yellow, bright yellow. And you see how it's growing in layers directly on wood, like on a tree or on a log or on a stump, all right? And you see in the underside of the cap, there's no gills, gills that radiate out like the spokes of a wheel in a standard store-bought mushroom. This one just has pore. So this is in the polypore mushroom. And it's called the chicken mushroom because if you pull the meat apart on this mushroom, the, the uh, flesh of this mushroom looks just like breast meat on a chicken. All right? So any tender part of the mushroom is edible. So I'll tend to just trim off the outer part with a knife. And if it's slicing like butter, that's great. If you have to hack away at it, it's too old to be really digestible. All right? And there's the edible lookalike. So this is one that's sort of a pinkish more pink and white than the regular orange and yellow cousin, but this one is at least as tasty as the, uh, as the former one. All right, the French call this mushroom trompette de mort, which means trumpets of death, but that's just because it's black. It's actually a delicious edible mushroom with no poisonous lookalikes. It's called the black trumpet chanterelle. And I have found this one in Southeast Mass, usually in a damp, mossy area, usually earlier in the summer. 
And um, the challenging part about this mushroom is finding the first one because they're relatively small. They're only two or three inches tall, and they're black, so a little hard to see. But once you see the first one, just stop in your tracks and look around, and often you will see dozens more, sometimes hundreds more. And the nice thing about this mushroom is that it dries very well. So if you luck out and you find more than you can use right away, you can dry them and store them in a glass jar in your pantry, and they'll keep for years until you're ready to use them. All right, here's the Belitis edgeless. This one um, is not that common on Cape Cod, but if you go north into southeast Mass, you run into it in other places in New England and elsewhere in the country, you run into it. So this is a bole, like the ones I have on the table here. So uh, the characteristic of boles is that this is a spongy layer underneath the cap here. So it's not gills, all right? Now, not all boletes are edible, but all boletes have that spongy layer on the underside of the cap with one weird exception, but I need, don't need to talk about that. So anyway, how do you distinguish the Boletus edgeless or the, the Porcini from the other Boletes? Well, first you want to look at the top of the cap, and this color right here is the same color as a loaf of baked bread. And then on the underside, that spongy layer on the underside, when it's mature, it's this olive yellow color, and when they're immature, it's this white color right there. And the key distinguishing characteristic in the Boletus edgeless is this business right here, and I apologize to those of you in the back that are having a little trouble seeing this. This is called a reticulation, this white net-like markings on the top of the stalk. It looks like you almost took a piece of gauze and you wrapped the top of the stalk with it. So the mushroom that you might run into that is uh, a look-alike, a close look-alike to this one is called the Tilopolis spellis of the bitter boli. It's not poisonous, it just tastes bitter. And on the bitter boli, this porous surface here is pink, and then those reticulations are brown. So that's not uh, the Boletus edges. You want to look for white or olive yellow here and white reticulations near the top of the stone. Mm -hmm. All right, here's one you're much more likely to find in the Cape. That's what I have here on the table. These are called scabber stalks. And the scabber are just these little black things that show up, the, they're little squamules that show up on the stalk. And um, the kind that, uh, as you may know, this part of the Cape is popular with Russians in the fall because yes. they're looking for this particular kind mostly, and yes. that's what's called the red mushroom, mm -hmm. meaning the red cap. And I have one that I found uh, on the way here today on the table here. There's another bigger uh, lacinum next to it. As far as I know, on Cape Cod, any mushroom that's in the lacinum genus is edible. Uh, yes, you have a question? I've heard that there's uh, been incidences of people eating this and having a bad reaction to it? On Cape Cod? On Cape Cod? I don't know if it's on no, Cape Cod. No, I haven't heard of that problem on but Cape this, Cod. But this species. Right. Now, I've heard about that in Maine. Oh, in Maine. Okay. Right. I haven't heard about that in Cape Cod. Okay. Yes. Do you eat any of these mushrooms raw? Or do you always try no, I don't, eat, I don't eat wild mushrooms raw. And there's a couple reasons for that. One reason is that not all mushrooms are edible raw. Some mushrooms are actually toxic raw, like the famous morel mushrooms. Morel mushrooms are toxic raw. So if you cook all wild mushrooms, you don't have to remember which ones are toxic raw or not. And also, occasionally another pathogen might hop on a mushroom, and if you're cooking the mushrooms, it'll uh, help deal with that too. All right, so we don't have any kids in the audience, but when I give talks with kids, I have to explain to them what that is. <laughs> because they won't know what a film canister is. Cause they, you know. So anyway, I put that in there for a scale. So these mushrooms get quite large, and it's not that unusual to have a cap almost a foot across on these uh, mushrooms. Wow. Although I tend to like them when they're young and really firm like that. They're going to be they're a little black. bit better. What's that? They, they black when you well. Yes, yeah, that's right. That's right, yeah, they, they will stain blue and then black when you cook them. All right, another kind that grows on the Cape and the islands is a, a kind with absolutely no poisonous lookalikes. It's called the beefsteak mushroom. And this looks like a piece of meat hanging on a tree. And when you cut it, it's got marbling just like a piece of meat. And when you squeeze it, red juice comes out like a piece of meat. Um, so um, my favorite way to cook this is just to brush it with a little teriyaki sauce and grill it on a hibachi like a piece of meat. All right. Here is a cauliflower mushroom, and I haven't found any of these on Cape Cod, but I have found them at Miles Standard State Forest, which is not far from here. And so that, uh, here's another version of it right here, and it looks like a big mass of yellowy eggnogs at the base of a pine tree this time of year. So uh, it's, uh, it's not too late for a look for it. And it's got no poisonous lookalikes, and it tastes like mushroomy eggnogs. It's really yummy. All right, this is probably the most bizarre organism I have in the show. This is corn smut, and this is a fungus that gets into the developing ears of corn. It swells up the kernels and turns them gray, 
And I'll admit it's not the most appetizing looking thing I ever thought of eating. But um, uh, anyway, but you can see that I'm, uh, I'm very excited finding this because I had heard that uh, this is a delicacy in Mexico. In fact, I'd heard that during the days of the Aztecs, that if you were a peasant and you found this corn smut growing in your corn, you weren't even allowed to touch it. So you'd have to send for an emissary of the emperor and they would take it away to the royal courts and only the royalty could eat it. And I thought, all right, it must be good. So I you know, brought it home. I cooked it up like you cook any standard mushroom. I just uh, sliced it up, uh, cooked it in some butter, a little onion, and I took a bite and it tasted like mud. And I thought, what is the big deal about this stuff? And so I tried it one more time. I tried cooking it in a Mexican style with some hot peppers, some poblano chiles, and there's some kind of chemical transformation that happens with the capsaicin in the hot peppers that makes the corn smut taste good. So that was my advice. All right. So hen of the woods mushrooms, these grow at the base of usually red or black oak trees, and the bigger and older the tree is, the more likely you are to find these. I've already seen baby ones of these showing up this season. And so the season for these is the next uh, month, maybe five weeks or so. And, um, and although those are big mushrooms more than a foot across, I've seen them bigger than that too. You know, that's a pretty typical specimen like that. And uh, yeah, sometimes you can find more than one at the base of a tree. But I actually prefer them at the chick stage when they're younger, before they're fully adult, because then the entire mushroom is nice and tender and mild at that stage. So, uh, uh, so I hope you find them. Mm -hmm. All right, so that's it for mushrooms. I got about 10 more minutes worth of plants, and then I'll take questions, and then I brought a few things for you to nibble and sip on at the end. And I hope it's enough for everybody. Mm -hmm. All right, so sumac. Uh, any red berried sumac is not poison sumac. Poison sumac, which I have found not far from here, has drooping clusters of greenish white berries and it grows in really wet areas so that usually you can't see the base of a poison sumac plant because it's below the surface of the water. That's how wet it likes it. All right? So uh, what you're going to run into is this staghorn sumac or on the cape you've got a lot of the winged sumac which is also called the shining sumac and there's also uh, smooth sumac. Uh, any red berried sumac is, is not only not poison sumac, it's an edible sumac. And I've made a drink from you from uh, the staghorn and smooth sumac and I'll explain how I did that. So you just pick the berries off the plant like that and what I'll do is just test one as I'll lick my finger and rub it on the berry cluster, make sure I'm getting nice strong pleasing acid flavor and then if I'm getting that, then the, berries, the, the berry clusters go into my basket and then this is all you do is get a, a bowl of water out and put those berry clusters in there. The water should be lukewarm or cold, by the way, not hot, not boiling, because that's going to make your drink too bitter. And just knead like you're making, playing with bread dough. It's, you're just kneading those berry clusters and rubbing the berries off their central cores into the water. And you're rubbing the flavor, which is on the outside of the berries, into the water. And the water will turn this pink or pinkish orange color. Then strain out the berries. You're done with them. And then pour the liquid through a filter like a uh, paper towel. And, uh, and then the liquid that goes through, you can drink hot or cold, sweetened or unsweetened. And I tend to drink it cold and sweetened like a pink lemonade. And so the entire time it takes from picking the berries off the plant to drinking the drink can be as little as a half an hour, right? And I made some for you, so you get to have that later. All right, so wild raisin, I have seen this plant in Truro, so I wanted to talk about it today. And um, it's uh, a viburnum. There are no poisonous species of viburnum, I'm happy to tell you. Uh, there are plenty that don't taste good, like the arrowwood, Viburnum dentatum, doesn't taste good. But the fruit of the wild raisin does taste good when it's ripe and it's that purple color, so after the pinkish color. And uh, they do have large flat stones in the center, so it's not like a raisin where you're just chewing up everything and it's all sweet and yummy. I mean, you have to spit out the seed, which is probably what the plant wants you to do anyway, help propagate it. So uh, anyway, but that's, that plant's at that stage right now. You could be harvesting it and eating it. All right, then nanny berry is another plant that has a larger fruit with a similar flavor, also viburnum. <coughs> okay, so um, we, there are several different kinds of grapes that grow on the Cape, and they're all edible, uh, so you don't need to know what exact species you have. This is one of the species you have called the fox grape of the Vitus labrusca, and this one's ripe right now, at least it is uh, uh, where I'm from. It might be a week later down here, but anyway, um, in this one, you often smell the grapes before you find them. You just follow your nose to the vine. 
find the grapes and stuff your face by the vine. And you can make stuff from those grapes if you want. So baskets like that, very typical to have my car filled with baskets like that this time of year. So there's a grape cheesecake you can make from that fox. It also makes really good sorbet. Then there's a riverside grape. So this one produces smaller, musky-flavored grapes, but some people that make the stuffed grape leaves prefer this species over the fox grape because the leaves are, are more delicate. And so, uh, so there's the stuffed uh, riverside grape leaves. But you can use any variety of grape leaf for stuffing. Obviously not now, okay? The leaves are too old now, but in June is the best time to pick them for stuffing. Okay, what's this plant? Very good, you guys are pros. Yes, I, I, I'll show this slide. These are cranberries, and you, you probably all know cranberries used to be called craneberries because of these flowers. They would sort of look like the crane birds, all right? So anyway, uh, yes, these are cranberries, and uh, you know, if I showed you that slide, you would have known what it was. All right, so um, uh, you probably all have your secret cranberry, wild cranberry bog that you pick from, and that's great. Uh, here in the Cape, there are abandoned bogs too, and those are perfectly fine cranberries. And uh, I will say that there probably is a little something to the effect that if you do pick your own cranberries and you leave them on the plants a little bit longer than the commercial people do, they do seem to get a little sweeter than the ones that you're buying at the store. So, uh, so that might be one reason. But you know, uh, anyway, so those are cranberries, and it's fun to gather your own. All right. So here are hazelnuts, and if you're wondering what was in the basket up here, these are hazelnuts that I gathered just in the past week or so. This is the time of year to do it. You need to pick the nuts off the little bushes. You can't wait till they hit the ground, or you'll never find them. The squirrels and chipmunks will get them all. So I picked them slightly underripe, spread them on a newspaper in my garage, and just let them season a little bit. Um, now, I would be misleading you if I told you, you haven't lived to try the flavor of a wild hazelnut because it's the same as a commercial hazelnut and our native nuts are smaller than a commercial hazelnut, but it is fun to gather them and um, so, uh, so you can. <coughs> All right, and here's another species of this kind I've seen on Chappaquiddick as well as the, uh, the uh, American hazelnut and this is the beaked hazelnut where you have this strange thing sticking out that looks like a bird's beak and the developing hazelnuts in that spherical part. Okay, so this is a, the same photo that's in the handout. Those of you who got the acorn handout that explains everything you need to do about acorns. Uh, that photo just shows you a little better than the handout does the difference between what's called the hard oak species and the soft oak species. All oak trees produce acorns and all acorns are edible. The issue is how much you process them. And I tend to use the white oak acorns because they tend to have lower levels of tannic acid. So there's the white oak acorn leaf and it's relatives that have these rounded lobes on the leaves, I look for those. But if all you have is the other kind, you can eat that kind too. All right, so here's ground nut. This is a plant that uh, the edible part is actually a tuber, it's not a true nut. So there it is, oops, sorry, uh, there it is. So those are underneath the surface of the ground, two or three inches down. Um, it's native to Cape Cod, and this is a plant that, if you don't know the story I'm about to tell you, it was a cache of groundnuts that Miles Standish found that enabled the pilgrims to survive the first harsh winter in the New World when they had pretty much eaten all the food that was still left over from the Mayflower. Is they had occupied a Native American encampment uh, that the Native Americans had abandoned several years earlier, probably because they all got smallpox. And anyway, Miles Standish found some groundnuts and they ate the tubers and that kept them going until the new food supplies came in and they were able to grow some food. Anyway, uh, one of the earliest uh, ordinances passed in the colonial era in Massachusetts was in the town of Aguam, which is now called Ipswich, where in the 1640s they passed a local law forbidding Native Americans to gather groundnuts. Mm -hmm. And the only reason I could think they would do that is they were trying to, the Englishmen were trying to hog them all for themselves. Mm -hmm. But anyway, so native species and what I will do is just take those groundnuts and slice them thinly crosswise and fry them in a little vegetable oil and make groundnut chips. Mm -hmm. Are the flowers edible? Uh, I don't think they're poisonous, and um, and let me just see, you see how there's you know there right. are these right. uh, beans, right. and I haven't eaten these either because I I let them mature and then I propagate plants from oh. the uh, berries. Okay, so Jerusalem artichokes are edible. I referred to them before, and the edible part of the tubers, and you can use those most ways. You use potatoes. You can bake them, boil them, mash them, fry them. 
And all right, so I'm just gonna finish the show to tell you a little bit what I'm doing since I retired in 2015. I'm taking on the role of Johnny Appleseed for native edible species. And I've set up a nursery out, <laughs> thank you. And, uh, and uh, I live in Arlington, Mass. Not far from where I live is this nursery where I'm propagating hundreds of plants, many of which I grew from seed that I gathered myself. And then I'm working on arrangements with cities and towns, state and federal agencies, schools and colleges, land trusts, and other groups to plant this stuff in appropriate places in the landscape. For example, tomorrow I'm going to Long Pasture Audubon Sanctuary in Barnstable, and Ian Ives and I are going to have my cars filled with plants for my nursery, and he and I will figure out appropriate places on the sanctuary to add them to diversify, further diversify what's already there. All right, so this list is online. This is a list of all the plants I know of in New England that are native and edible. It's more than 150 species. I haven't figured out how to grow all these yet, but I'm about one third of the way through the list. All right, so there's a shot of my nursery. Uh, you can see it's not, you know, it's not a retail nursery. This is just a way station where I'm growing plants where they just go off, you know, to be planted, so it's not particularly tidy. All right, here's an example of some of the projects I've done. Uh, so let me just talk about a couple coastal projects. So there's an island off the coast of Marblehead called Browns Island, a Crown and Shield Island. It's owned by the trustees of reservations, and I noticed that there were no beach plums there. So I said to the trustees, could I plant some beach plums there? And they said yes. So I went out there, determined locations for the plants. And uh, so we've seen habitats like that where beach plums grow, and I thought beach plums would grow here if I planted them. So I organized some volunteers, I dug the holes and then I organized volunteers and we took the plants over the mud flat at low tide to the island and put them in the holes that I had dug. And, uh, and yes, so, and I have, I have pictures of the plants, I mean they've been in there long enough, they're now fruiting, uh, which is really fun. So there's uh, beach lumps now where they weren't before. So here's another coastal project I did in Cohasset where this land trust owned an island, a barrier beach, uh, where we also planted beach plums and other plants that were appropriate to the site. Okay, and here's the last coastal project I have, I think, in this slideshow. This is uh, Baker's Island off the coast of Salem, where there's a lighthouse and 10 acres around it, and, um, and we took a bunch of plants out there. So this is what I'm doing in addition to giving talks like this. All right, last plant I'm going to talk about in this show <laughs> is the plant that is all over Cape Cod. Because this plant can do what the black locust can do, it can make its own nitrogen fertilizer, so it has no trouble growing in your sandy soil. This is a plant called autumn olive. Uh, so this is the one that has the red fruit. That This doesn't seem to be a good year for autumn olives, but usually the plants are bent down from the weight of the red fruit around this time of year or within the next month. And by the way, if you've been calling that plant Russian olive, you are incorrect. It's actually autumn olive. Russian olive fruit is more of a, a, a yellowy, grayish color. Uh, it's also edible too, but not as yummy as the autumn olive fruit. So there's a close-up of the flowers. They have a very nice smell, very similar to sweet pepper bush, actually. Just a weird coincidence. That's what you typically see this time of year within the next month. So as I said, invasive spe species, you do not have to hold back, pick all you want. And so what I typically do is pick um, uh, gobs of this fruit because the time when it's ripe is when just tickling the plants, the fruit falls into your basket. Uh, if you have to really yank at them to get them off, they're not ripe yet. And then uh, I just uh, uh, bring them home, get out a lobster pot, put just enough water in the bottom to keep the fruit from scorching about a half of an inch, and then I uh, uh, simmer the fruit for a while to soften it up. I put everything through a food mill, and then I, uh, that gets all the seeds out. And then I take that puree, and I pour it into trays in a food dehydrator, and I let it run overnight, and what I get Oh, there's a close-up of the berries. So what I get is this fruit leather on the side here, and I brought some for you. So uh, this will be the first thing I feed you. So take that, pass that around. Take that, pass that around. Hopefully there's a piece for everybody. All right. So, okay, last slide of the show. So this photo documents a really successful foraging day I had, not on Cape Cod, but in Worcester County uh, about 15 years ago. And all right, so what's going on in this photo? So um, one thing I haven't talked to you about is shagbark hickory nuts, which is my number one favorite edible species. Um, it really doesn't grow in the Cape, but I brought some, a tree for Ian, so there'll be one at the Long Pasture Audubon Society. Uh, but anyway, I do have examples of them in the basket over there that you can look at. A uh, whole bunch of autumn olives, you know that one. Uh, there's wild pears over here. Uh, all these mushrooms here, that's the porcini mushroom, the Belitis edulis. 
And then this guy right here, I have found this in the cave. This is the Agaricus arvensis, or the horse mushroom. And that one you could find later on in the season, uh, toward the end of September, definitely as the weather cools and there's more rain. Uh, it's a giant counterpart of the standard store-bought mushroom. So you're probably wondering what the barbecue girl is doing in the photo. Well, somebody had put one of those out with their trash and I needed one of those at home, so I just foraged for that while I was foraging for everything else. So that is my show. Thank you. Thank you.